All right, we're recording. Yeah, I would like to call a finance committee meeting um, Tuesday, October 4, 2022 to order at five minutes after three and um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2023, which has been extended by subsequent legislation. This meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom or by telephone. There's no in-person attendance of members of the public, but every effort is being made to ensure that they, uh, that the public can adequately access the proceedings, uh, proceedings in real time by technological means. Um, I'm going to um, now go through the um, members of the committee to make sure that everybody can hear me and we can hear them. And I also, uh, before doing that, want to just remind everybody that this meeting is being um, recorded. And uh, with that, um, uh, Lynn Guzmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Here. Alloy. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Uh, Michelle Miller. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. And uh, we'll confirm um, Alicia's attendance uh, when uh, she's able to join us. And um, with that, um, I think the other thing that I'll want to announce is that um, we do have an opportunity for public comment. And uh, it, it, we will. Um, try and get to that a little bit later in the meeting so that we can have some discussion and uh, that gives the uh, public a chance to um, react off of things that have been discussed also. Um, so with that said, um, I think that uh, are there any other preliminary questions about the agenda or should we just jump in? Do you want me to put the agenda up? Um, I don't think that we need to, um, the first item is really turning over to Sean because, um, he's going to, uh, want to explain to us about supplemental, uh, um, appropriations, um, and that includes, uh, for the operating budget. Uh, track and field and roads and sidewalks uh, were the things that were listed. So uh, um, I soon I'll recognize Kathy first and then turn okay, it over. It's just to one comment, and it may be on the agenda, but um, I would like to get from you a meeting schedule going through December. Um, I heard last night at the council that there will be a meeting. Uh, following the next council meeting, I'm probably going to miss that. I'm going to be out of the country, but I just wanted to get a sense. Um, I'm assuming we're going to be meeting at 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon. So I'm not in a rush on it. I just want to put hold, I want to put hold on my calendar. Yep. Um, what we had said, what I had proposed in an email, and um, there was nobody who got back to me saying that they were not in agreement with this, is that we would meet um, at 3.30 on the day following council meetings, and that that would be our regular schedule for the remainder of the year. Okay. Uh, we can create that into a schedule, but... Um, no, that, that's, that's fine perfect. with me, and it's just a question, or would, would we be starting at 3 or 3.30, and I will just mark, I will work, mark it in my calendar. We said we would start at 3.30. I, Michelle may have something more to say about that, because uh, today's uh, modification was uh, something that she had uh, uh, worked out uh, at my request. Michelle? Yeah, I, I will have a lot of trouble if, I mean, a lot of trouble, but I have to pick up my son at 4.30 on Tuesdays. So I was hoping we would meet at three and maybe I'd have to leave a little bit early. And I think 
Kathy had suggested the possibility, I think, <laughs> of, you know, one of us might need to come late, one of us might need to leave early kind of thing. Um, but I can talk to Alicia again and just see, because I think it was the two of us that had some limitations. I don't know about anybody else, but um, I would prefer to meet at, at three if possible. So I didn't want to take a lot of time with this. I just was going to pencil it in um, and I got the information I needed. Okay, um, so we are going to have to um, see if we can work this out on the start schedule uh, because uh, there was general agreement about the afternoons and Tuesday. The reason for the day following is, is that gives us the most time to turn around reports to um, the council and get them to the council on time. Um, so, Sean, are you ready to uh, start us off with the uh, supplemental appropriations, FY23 supplemental appropriations? Sure. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, do you see uh, the table from last night on the screen? Yes. Okay. So I'll just do a little bit of a recap and I'll just focus on the first three for now. Um, so there were three supplemental appropriations that were proposed. Um, the first one is to increase town, school, and library operating budgets by a half percent, um, the FY23 operating budgets by a half percent. And the cost of doing that is $351,938. Um, we would pay for that using the state aid that came in higher from what we budgeted. And I'll pull up a, a, a budget projection um, worksheet from the memo that was in the packet in a second, just to uh, show what that looks like. The intent is that this would be added to the operating budgets um, and establish a higher base to go forward. Um, the other two appropriations, one for roads and sidewalks, which would be for a million dollars. Um, that was to address, you know, we, we know that there's a large backlog of road and sidewalk repairs. Uh, last year, we put an extra million dollars into it. This year, we're trying to put in, um, some additional funds into it. Some of this is in, in anticipation of when we do start having debt for the building projects, we're not gonna have as much money and capital um, to do roads and sidewalks. So as much as we can sort of do some extra now, uh, will help uh, mitigate that impact down the road. Uh, this would be, one time, although again, we may look to do it, you know, if we do have additional funds in the future, we may look to do it again next fall. And then the last one is the region track and field, which uh, the council has already, so this is the one that there were sort of two tiers of a project. There was sort of the base tier, which would just be a replacement of the track. Um, the council has already approved a debt authorization for that project. The school committee, regional school committee, um, wanted to consider doing a larger version of that project, which would turn the track and put an artificial or a synthetic uh, turf surface in the middle. Um, that's a much larger project. And so they laid out a financial plan that divvied up the cost of that uh, to each of the member towns. And so for Amherst, there were sort of three pieces to our contribution. There was um, the original debt authorization, there was a CPA request, and then there was the, the difference or the balance left, which is what's in front of you here. Um, so the council has already approved the debt authorization. They've already approved the CPA. And so this is the third and final uh, component of that funding plan, which would get Amherst up to its share. Um, I did check in with, um, with Doug Slaughter from the regional schools. There have been no financial commitments from the other three towns, new financial com commitments from the other three towns as of today. Um, some did, one or two did contribute some CPA funds already towards the, the planning, um, but the regional schools are planning on submitting CPA requests to each of those towns. Um, I'm not sure how much they're going to be submitting for, but um, one has already been submitted and the, the uh, Doug will work with the CPA timelines with the other towns to submit requests to them as well. And I'm okay. anticipating those votes on the uh, CPA would to happen if Fall they would happen at, uh, I believe, their Springtown meeting. I, I would, I'll have to double check on the timeline, but I do not think they are um, votes that will happen in time for to be in place before the deadline that was established. But so why don't is, we open it up to questions on does um, uh, FY23 appropriations, uh, Lynn? 
another question that was asked last night was about fundraising. And I didn't know whether you had any update on that. And then the other question that I think comes back to this group, and that is, do we want to recommend to extend the deadline so that the town meetings have happened before we make a decision one way or another? Thank you. So on the fundraising front, um, I've heard that there's some organizing going on, but I have not heard that there's been any um, donations received or any any money raised at this point. And, and to your second point about a recommendation, um, I think if the council approves this and Amherst has sort of funded its share, uh, I think it makes sense to have a conversation with the region about, you know, what do you, if you don't, what are you going to do if you don't have enough money um, by the deadline? Are you going to really sort of go back to the, the lower tier, or you know, is there a, you know, an intermediate step you can take? But it is sort of their self-imposed uh, deadline because uh, they their track is in bad condition, and you know, I think it makes sense from their point of view if they need to do something. They can't keep kicking the, you know, kicking it down the road. Anything else, Lynn, or um, otherwise, Bob? Yeah, I just had a question about the um, the increase in the um, the expenditures due to the the sort of windfall of, of state aid. Is that going to raise the the baseline for doing next year's calculation of two and a half percent? And if so, does that make sense given that it was sort of a a one time? Is that a one time deal from the state? So no, that's a great question. Um, so we do anticipate we do plan it to be an increase in the base on an ongoing basis. It does increase our base with the state as well. So the our base with the state in terms of our state aid has gone up. Basically, what it was is every year we make a you know we we project what our increase in state aid is going to be. Uh, this year was probably one of the more unusual years where there was a pretty big gap between what the governor projected for increases in unrestricted general government aid and what the legislature was proposing. And uh, so we went with the more conservative route when we proposed our budget. Um, the budget was approved rather late this year um, by the legislature and ultimately they went with the higher number. And so that will be our number going forward. Um, could they ever reduce their state aid number? Sure, um, but it is tied to what revenues they brought in. Um, so, and during the, the height of the pandemic, they, the worst they did was stay flat. They didn't go down in their state aid, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding the first section on FY23 supplemental appropriations? And while people are thinking of questions, I'll just, um, I also checked on the schools just to get a little more specificity on sort of what these, uh, you know, the, the operate, operational costs that they're hoping to build into their base going forward. Um, so again, at the elementary level, we had a lot of discussion about the arts and technology positions uh, last year that if we did, if stated did come in higher, we would revisit that. Um, so that's why, why we're having this conversation today. Um, they are funding that, I don't remember if it's fully or partially, but they're funding it at least partially with ESSER funds. So again, this would help them phase off of those ESSER funds. Um, and at the secondary level, um, they, they created two uh, mental health positions or um, sort of tier two intervention is how they described them to me, um, specifically in response to COVID. And those are positions that are being funded with ESSER right now that if their base is up, um, they would like to keep. Lynn? I thought there was a problem with us increasing our regional contribution and that we had to give it to them in some other form, like a gift or a designation. Could you? Yes. Explain? So for this, so for the region for FY23, we sort we have two options. Um, we can either donate it to them, which is a little bit unusual. And, and if, um, if we go that route, either way, I think we're gonna have to adjust a little bit on the, um, we'll have to look at the order and see if it affects how we we word it. Um, but the two options would be either to donate the funds to them as a gift and they would put it in their gift fund and then use it for the cost that we've talked about. Um, or we just put this year's amount into uh, the track and field because uh, we know that they're, they're trying to raise more money for the track and field. We put it there for FY23 only but when we go to FY24 to start the budget process, we would start them at the higher base so that it can be part of the, be built into the assessment method going forward. 
Jeffy. Yeah, I, um, I have a question on whether, I don't know how to phrase this because I'm not suggesting we do this, but do we need to do it equally across the big buckets? So for example, with regional, if we didn't do the allocation to regional seems since we seem to have to contort ourselves to a way of doing the money. Um, I've been struck by at the town level of uh, whether it's grant raising, the, the various kinds of activities we're doing. Are there any positions that we're temporarily funding with ARPA money that we could instead hold the ARPA money for something else. So do you understand what I'm getting at? You know, that um that that are in the same kind of world that we I think we did the two years of a and my memory is one that would work on all the housing projects we've got, but we just be it wasn't a full-time new position we were creating. So I, I don't I know it raised a host of problems to think of it not just being a divided up. Um, so it's that's a question, and I don't have an answer for it. I'm raising it as a question. Yeah, so um, I think that position specifically that you mentioned is a CPA funded um, uh, position, a sort of a housing okay, affordable so, yeah. housing coordinator. But I know, but in, I get what your your question is. Um, could we? Yes, I think the one of the strengths of sort of our town's budget process is that generally we have um, we treat all departments equally, um, and when we don't, it. it does cause some friction and, and and some issues with sort of just how the budget process works in general. Um, and so we have heard a need from the regional schools bec uh, because they are also relying on ESSER funds similar to the elementary schools and similar to us with, with ARPA. Um, so if they didn't have a need, then I would say maybe that's something we would wanna you know consider, but um, because they have articulated a need uh, around some of their positions, I, I think it makes sense to treat everybody equally in this circumstance. So then, then I think, um, Andy, when we do, you know, I'm in favor of doing this. So when we do it, maybe we should write a few sentences that say the um, various entities, the department have articulated a need, you know, so that the, we're not just saying we always do it equally, but we, we're actually, we're doing it thoughtfully because we, the, the question and the answers we just got on where might it go are, are being explored. Um, so that that was my only concern because it will become part of Nick, as you just said, is part of next year's base then. Yeah, yeah. And, and the other part, I just don't wanna lose sight of, part of the reason for doing it this year, and, and this is why a donation to the region may make the most sense, um, is part of this is also just to deal with the inflation that we're dealing, yeah. you know, fuel costs are way up, utility costs are way up. Will it, you know, our, they may stay up, but um, they are sort of, in some cases, you know, at historic highs. Um, and so if those come back down, that'll allow them to, that'll free up some funding in the future. Lynn? Will it become part of the base for the region? Because that kind of yeah. doesn't. So, so they will, so there's a couple of things. So we, we looked at some forecasts from the region. Uh, the, there was the regional assessment method working group mm -hmm. um, that, that showed some forecasts. Some of those forecasts had increases larger than two and a half percent for Amherst, if you remember that. Yeah. Um, and so this potentially could allow us to be closer, at least in that first year, to what they're proposing, because there'd be an extra half percentage point in addition to whatever guidance is, there is for next year. Um, so it may work um, to kind of smooth that out from an Amherst perspective. Um, but as always, if Amherst contributes more, the other towns are going to have to contribute more as well. Um, they will have to come up proportionally. So the regional schools will have to, you know, when they develop their budget forecast this year and they're, you know, they look at their assessment information and project out their assessment, they're going to have to kind of work through all that for next year. And we'll, I assume we'll find out more at the four town meeting. Um, yeah. Worst case scenario is they don't ask for, you know, they may come in lower than our guidance, which wouldn't be the, you know, the worst thing either. Yeah. Thank you. I think the other thing to note is that in Paul or somebody else might want to speak to this too. Paul convened a meeting of the budget coordinating group um, pursuant to the charter. And this um, was specifically discussed at the uh, budget coordinating group. 
needless to say, there was um, good support from the schools and libraries for um, doing this because they are suffering the inflationary trends that Sean was talking about. Um, and we did have some discussion about the regional school question there too. I don't know, I'll leave it to Lynn and Paul and Sean if they want to add anything about BCG. Well, so I'll leave it at that. It was joyful. <laughs> um, okay, so anything else on the subject of the FY23 supplemental appropriations? I'm um, holding off on uh, proposing motions on orders to give Felicia a little bit more time to see if she's able to make it since she frequently has problems till around 3.30. Um, and the other thing that I was going to do is once we complete the discussion of these first two segments is probably when I'm going to work in the uh, uh, public comment so that we get public uh, is able to comment prior to our taking votes on the proposed orders. Um, so that said, um, the next things we really want to talk, um, talk about a little bit is the proposal to create a capital stabilization fund, which was also brought up last night at the council meeting, and then the uh, proposed transfers. Um, so Sean, I guess it's back to you. Yeah, so the, the next chunk are these four bottom ones. Um, so why don't we do reparations because that's sort of um, separate. So the town council, uh, I think a few months ago, made a commitment to fund uh, reparations or consider funding reparations annually um, in an amount equivalent to what we bring in in cannabis taxes. And to do that annually, uh, provided that the town is in good financial condition and do it up, in uh, up to a total contribution of $2 million. And so there's been an initial contribution of about 206,000 uh, from uh, last fall. And this, or maybe, maybe slightly higher. Um, and then, so this fall, this, the amount being proposed is 134,330. And again, that's equivalent to what we brought in in FY22 cannabis tax money. Um, so that's the first transfer. The funding source would be free cash. Uh, so there will be a fourth quarter budget report presented to you all sometime, hopefully at the next meeting. Um, and that fourth quarter report will go through FY22 and um, what, uh, uh, where we had additional funds come into free cash, some on the revenue side from revenues coming in higher than what was budgeted, some on the expense side from expenses coming in lower than what was budgeted. And so when that happens, there's some other adjustments, but that goes into our free cash. And then the town has a policy that it will um, maintain a, a balance of 5% in free cash, 5% of um, operating revenues. And anything above 5%, it will transfer out, or there's a, a list of options. And some of, some of them are what we're proposing um, for the supplemental appropriations. So, um, so reparation, so the 134,330 is coming from the amount of free cash we have in excess of 5%. The other transfer, um, so then the, that's one piece. The other piece we propose to create a capital stabilization fund. So you can create as many stabilization funds as you want. I would say we don't wanna create a bunch of them, but in, mo in many towns, they do have capital stabilization funds. The region, for example, has a cap capital stabilization fund. They're, they're pretty common. Um, and we view it as a helpful planning tool uh, to staff to help us know exactly what we have to support the four building projects. And also if we have goal, you know, when we look at models in a, in a meeting or so, and you'll see there's different amounts of reserves required to make a model work, it lets us set targets for what do we need to get, you know, what do we need to save up in this capital stabilization fund for a model to be possible. Um, so it's helpful for us from the planning perspective. I think it's also helpful for the public because right now when the public looks at our reserves or when anyone looks at our reserves, they just see a big number and it's the combination of sort of our, you know, the reserves we keep for economic downturns and what we've been building up for capital. And it's hard to know where that line is. Um, and so we think by 
creating this fund, separating them, it'll make it really transparent to everybody. What do we have for general reserves and what do we have for the four building projects? Um, and so we propose to create a capital stabilization fund and sort of a, a parallel policy of, we wanna keep the 5% in free cash, we would keep 10% of operating revenues in uh, our general stabilization. So that when you add those two together, you have come up with a total of 15%. And then anything above and beyond that would go um, to reparations each year to, to honor the commitment made there. And then the, anything above that would go towards the capital stabilization fund. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, uh, talking to Kathy, one of the reasons why we came up with 15% for sort of the general reserves, um, one that has been our the town's policy for quite some time it was a five to fifteen percent and so this is the upper limit of fifteen percent um two i believe there was a, a government finance officers association sort of best practice at one point that had that five to fifteen percent range um and then but the the other reason is that our bond rating agencies one of the things they look at are, is our budgetary flexibility and we always score really well in budgetary flexibility um, and the metric they look at to have the highest score is 15%. Um, so if you have 15%, it's a little bit different metric, but if you keep that 15% level, um, then we can maintain that sort of highest score uh, in that area of our bond rating. So there's a lot of, you know, again, that's an area that could go back and forth. I'll tell you, I think I've told some of you, you know, Sony wanted 20%. So I had to talk her down and get to 15%, but I know someone like even lower than that. Um, but I think 15% is, you know, it's consistent with our policies. It's, um, it's what people are familiar with. Um, it, it's consistent with what we're trying to do on our bond rating front. Um, and, and the amount seems like it's an adequate cushion for an economic downturn. And so these final two orders, sorry, just to wrap it up, uh, the final two orders you see on the bottom. So the 1.7 uh, 1, 1, million, 1,670,120, that is what is left in free cash that's an above 5% after making all these other orders that we've proposed here. So this would be the balance that would be left to transfer and that would leave 5% in free cash. And then the bottom one, is uh, from the general stabilization fund, and that's what could be transferred out and would leave 10% in stabilization and the rest would go to capital. So it's really kind of like moving your savings account and breaking it up into the, you know, into the sort of the purposes that you're planning for. Okay, um, one thing that I just led and then I'm gonna start recognizing um, those of you who have hands up, one is, uh, but what I was going to just point out is that way back in the dusty past when John Misanti was the town manager and Sandy Pooler was the finance director, there was a proposal that they made to town meeting to create a capital stabilization fund and um, town meeting rejected it. Um, Finance Committee and Select Board at the time recommended it, but town meeting uh, just felt that um, they supported all of the money being in stabilization, but they didn't understand or support um, the creation of a um, separate fund and splitting it into two pieces. So it stayed the way it was. So this is kind of coming back at that. Bob? I just wanted to verify that um, these two separate stabilization funds are fungible back and forth, right? I mean, we're not locked into the, you know, we got to keep only uh, capital in capital sta stabilization fund. We can never move it to the general stabilization fund and, and vice versa. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, so, so ultimately it's always within the council's purview through a two-thirds vote. Um, to, to use it for an allowable expenditure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It, it, just to add on, it's, it's just a higher bar to take it out as the two thirds vote of the council. So as, as, as Sean said, but it, it can be used for, if it takes that, comes out of capital, it can be used for any expenditure if needed. Kathy? Um, Sean, I think it would be helpful, I mean, well, or at least it's helpful to me. Um, we are moving 3.7 million when I just added it up out of what's free cash and that's above 5%. I know we haven't seen it yet, but you have the number. So we're voting 
based on you saying this is above 5%. So mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful in our finance report with a, again, I'm supporting this to say free crash this year came in at X. Yep. We're talking about and leaving 5% in, we're moving 3.7 just to do the math for people. Yep. And then the same, yep. and then what I asked last night is we, we've built up 21 million or whatever the number is in our stabilization fund and we're moving seven out you know so that people 15 percent doesn't isn't as meaningful to people as knowing they still have this other amount for both everything else so as bob was asking it could be used for capital but it could be used for um one year we got one of Dave Zomax, a deal that's too good to, to turn down, um, that we needed some money to buy a piece of land since, um, you know, uh, once in a lifetime. Um, but anyway, we, so I don't know where the land is capital, but I just think having both of those in this will provide the context to show what we're doing. Because I had one person, um, you know, worried about that, when we do this in stabilization, it's all going to go for the buildings and there won't be anything left to do other things we want. And I said, no, 15% is still a big amount of money. And we don't normally draw on stabilization for operating budgets. We right. we, we do it in a an emergent plug a hole. It's, um, so I, that's all I'm asking. I know you have the numbers and I'm just thinking for, for me to feel comfortable that sure, move three at the financial is very specific move this million dollars move this having knowing that we're still leaving five percent would be useful that's it yeah no I, I will put together maybe a slide like this that i'll send to andy that he can put in the the packet um just for the record i'll just say that our free cash was certified this year at eight million two hundred and seven thousand seven hundred and sixteen dollars in the general fund um and five percent of our current operating budget is 4,495,267. And so the difference between those two numbers is should equal the sum of the things that we're proposing. Um, but I will sort of put that in a easy to follow chart um, so that people have it. Thank you, Michelle. That was one of my questions, Sean, what was the total free cash that was certified? So thank you. Um, can you pull that chart back up or whoever mm -hmm. has that, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, a little bit confused about the two capital stabilization fund lines here. Um, sure. Could you just explain that one more time? Yeah, so um, so there'll be one capital stabilization fund, but there's um, money in two different places that would be going into it, so, which is why there's two different orders. So okay. this first one, FY23 12A, this would be the money from free cash. That's in excess of 5%. Um, and this one's paired up with the reparation order because they're both coming from free cash and they're both transfers to stabilization funds. Um, but that's why this one is separate. And then the bottom one is coming from our existing stabilization fund. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a different source and it's the amount above 10%, again, trying to get to a total of 15% for general reserves. Um, in general reserves, we view those as our free cash plus our plus our general stabilization um, is what make up sort of our general reserve balance. Um, so that's why there's two of here. There, there's two different um, places where they're coming from. I see. So for the one that's coming from the general, um, that's a one time for this year coming right. from, okay, that you're moving right. um, to make this special savings account for capital needs. Okay. Ex exactly. And then going forward, we would, again, every year, the first thing we would do would be we keep free cash at five percent. We keep the general stabilization at ten percent. Again, those numbers will um, what ten percent of the operating revenues will change a little bit every year because our operating revenues go up a little bit every year. Um, so the first thing that will happen is those will stay at those percentages. Um, the next thing that would happen would be making the commitment, uh, the reparation transfer that uh, based on that commitment. And then if there's still free cash available above and beyond the, the five percent. Um, then we would consider this transfer to capital stabilization. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. And then one other question. Um, Paul mentioned the higher bar, the two thirds vote of the town council. Um, that's always been true for stabilization money, right? So there's nothing- yeah, That's already in place. It's not, so free cash is a majority vote. Um, 
and general stabilization is a two thirds majority vote for expending. Perfect. But, Thank but, you. But Sean, just to ask you, when we move the 7.8 into this other, is that a two thirds vote? I believe it will be because you're you're sort of you're appropriating it out of one, you're doing an appropriation and transfer to move it from one stabilization fund to another. It's the taking it out of the stabilization fund. The general stabilization fund requires two thirds. Putting it into the new capital stabilization fund wouldn't require two thirds, but since it's a single vote, you have to go to the higher number. Sean, uh, Alicia is in the audience. Oh, let me just stop sharing so I can let her in. Hi, hey, Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, so uh, just so you know, welcome aboard. Uh, we um, have been going through the um, some of the same material was presented last night, but asking additional questions. I won't try and repeat, repeat them. Uh, we deliberately were waiting to take votes until you were here, so the, no votes have been taken. So the first section was uh, talking about the uh, supplemental appropriations from FY23 for FY23. And then we got into the creation of the capital stabilization fund and stabilization fund uh, transfers that were uh, same chart that was um, at last night's meeting. And that's what the questions are about right now. Then I was going to go to public comment so that the public could comment before we voted. And then I have a series of motions to go with each of the orders. Um, so that's kind of where we are in process. Um, so Bernie. Just curious as to how much is left in the general, I shouldn't say, how much is the value of the general stabilization fund right now? Currently in our general stabilization fund, if, before any um, any transfer, um, I'm going to round this because the number I have is the combination of two separate numbers. But um, we have about 16 million in the general stabilization. Okay, seven point eight. Or sorry, up. sorry, we have we have about 16.6 uh, million in the general <clears throat> stabilization. The reason why I have to round that is because now we have two stabilization funds. We have the reparation <laughs> stabilization fund and the and the general stabilization fund, and I just have the balance for the two combined. Okay, um, so step seven point eight is coming out of the current sixteen. Point eight Correct. coming out of the current sixteen, Sean, or is it coming out of a bigger yeah. number? No, it's coming out of the um, the sixteen. Out of the sixteen, okay. Yeah, because because if you think of our budget, just for people to have sort of the perspective, our our total budget is eighty nine, roughly mm -hmm. ninety million um, for FY twenty three. So if you think about ten percent of ninety million, um, you know, it's about nine million, which is what would be left in stabilization. Okay, and then again, there's that five, ten, fifteen percent hierarchy that drives what the allocation is into each of these buckets. Right, yeah, you'd have first would keep free cash at 5%, then mm -hmm. any we'd keep our general stabilization at 10% to make a total of 15. The, the, the last question that I have on this whole thing is, uh, uh, have you got any indication that the changes the Commonwealth made in the uh, marijuana law and the can cannabis laws are gonna impact what our cannabis revenues are? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I mean, if you I think, don't know, I think they, well, I think they will definitely impact, uh, there, there will be impacts on the host agreement revenues that we have, the community, um, the community impact payments. Um, what the reparation payment is mirrored off of is the tax money. Um, okay. and so, you know, potentially there could, you know, so we've seen that some, big fluctuations in the tax money. You could, a couple of years ago, it was about $200,000. This most recent year, it was 130. It's really driven by the recreational marijuana um, activity in town. So I'd say it's right now, we're still in this sort of unpredictable place of what will be okay, the, but the, of, the, the yeah. formula to allocate money into the reparations funds is still it's based on the yeah, it's based on the tax, not the okay, it's, it's maintained. It's not uh, the changes in the host agreement won't affect that. Not that I've seen, though. No. Not the tax side. 
Great, thank you. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to suggest to Sean that maybe we should clarify very clearly that the total town reserves are X and we're just moving them into these different buckets, uh, but nothing's changing. Sure, uh, I think that's a good idea. You know, just so people aren't confused that we're taking money away from something. Right. No, I think that's right. I think the only thing I, I will say is that, you know, the money we put in capital stabilization, the intent is it will support the four building projects. And, and that's and that's why we did build it. Whereas our general reserves, we we generally don't want to touch them unless there's an economic downturn and we use that to support our budgets. Um, but whereas right. the capital we, reserves were built up specifically for that purpose. Right. But we we sort of had that in there in right. the general stabilization. Fund it's there already. Just making yep. it explicit. And I, I think that's fine. I'm just suggesting we make sure people understand we're not really changing anything other than not changing the total. We're just moving it around into different buckets. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we, uh, since we've now set it up so that we have essentially almost two weeks to do the next report, I will make the um, effort to get the draft report out in plenty of time so that, um, and I really encourage all members of the committee to read it and send me back comments to make sure that I have that clear in the committee report. Um, Kathy? Yeah, I was just um, underscoring what Bob just said, and I thought I wasn't as clear as I should have been, but it's great to have someone saying it again, a table, Sean, that shows mm -hmm. this is what we've got. And this is what we'll have afterwards and just showing that the two add and just at the point you check your 15%, if I multiply 15% times 90 million, I get to a certain number. So just, just making sure that the concepts line up sure. and then up above it's free cash. We had this much free cash. We're taking that, you know, that much out. So, you know, I'm, we then end up with a capital stabilization fund with 9.5 million, which is a very nice number, <laughs> I must say. You know, I mean, it's a good number because it it's not tiny. Um, and you can think of that is that is there to really start thinking about where does that go and, and how do we draw on it? So I, I that's why I like this idea a lot. Yeah. So Lynn? Yeah, I just want to build on what people are requesting, but also clarify that, in fact, we are going to spend some of this money by the supplemental appropriations we're making. So there is a subtraction off the top that's not going into any reserves. Yeah, um, so the, the nine and a half already accounts for those, um, the, yeah. the, the other appropriations. But you're right, we, we could put more if we didn't do those, but um, we felt that those other initiatives were also important to make progress on. I like the fact that we start with, we had this much before and now we have this much in free cash and now we're subtracting this and we're doing this and we're doing that. Anything that to make it clear to people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that um, I hope we never face the situation that I'm about to describe. Um, and But we've never really gone back and defined fiscal health and I hope we don't ever have to for the purposes of um, the cannabis funds. Um, but it's not automatic. It's it's based on fiscal health. And, you know, we may at some point have to look at something and say, you know, we really need to do a supplemental here. And it means we don't have as much for reparations. I mean, this is something that Michelle and I discussed to a fairly well before we started. I'm hoping we never are in that situation, but I just want to be clear that that's part of the, um, you know, part of what even AHRA um, understood. Yeah, yeah. one sign, I mean, one easy sign that I would look to for that would be, are we able to maintain the 5% of free cash? Um, mm. You know, if there's a year where we're not able to maintain right. that, then that would be a sign um, right. to me that we would need to rethink kind of what contribution or transfers we're making. Right. But for this year, I think nobody's raising a question that on this so uh, that makes it appropriate to make the transfer under the terms that we had talked about. Michelle? 
Yeah. Um, thanks, Lynn, for bringing that up, because I, I do think that that's a challenge um, with this particular <laughs> setup here. Um, while I understand it and it was um, something that we all agreed to, I want to make sure that we can find some way as the years go by and maybe there aren't the same people here or there's not that institutional memory of things that it gets enshrined somehow into the process and i was really pleased just to see that it already has in a way um and really appreciative of that and in listening to what sean said even about like the markers that might um, indicate whether or not it's possible in a given year. Um, but I do think the point about the cannabis uh, sales tax, even though the community impact fees won't affect that, I do wonder how the recreational business is going to continue to do. Um, so I think that's also another thing to just keep an eye on um, as that fluctuates. Okay. Um Anything else that um, the other thing that I wanted to me just mention, and then I'm going to go to the public comment so we can keep this moving along the path we were described. Um, the other thing that was discussed last night a little bit um, at the council meeting was the question of revisions to the um, major building plan. And um, Clearly, the capital stabilization fund plays into that. They're directly linked because uh, funds from the capital stabilization fund need to be available to make the building project plan work. And uh, what was agreed was that at the next finance committee meeting, which is two weeks from today, that uh, that would be a focus of discussion at that time um, as one of the agenda items. So uh, in, uh, that was clear with the council yesterday um, So, because we wanted to make sure that councilors had advance notice so that they could attend the finance committee meeting as has happened in the past when there's been a matter of exceptional interest. Uh, so I don't think there's anything more we need to say on it unless somebody else has something they want to, to add. If there are no further hands right now from the committee, I'm going to um, ask the, if, if there's any member of the public um, that would like to offer public comment, um, I would appreciate it if they would raise their hand so they know. Um, it does not have to be on um, the subjects that we've been discussing in the proposed orders. Um, it can be on anything that's relevant to the committee's um, responsibilities as a whole. Um, and uh, I think I saw Tony and Tony is um, now with us. So uh, Tony Cunningham. Hi, thanks yeah. so much, yeah. Tony. Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Um, I think this capital stabilization account idea is a great, great idea. And I love seeing a significant amount being transferred in there to support uh, the capital projects. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible to get sort of a cost benefit analysis or a pro con on lowering the general stabilization to 10% instead of 15%. As Sean mentioned, that bond rate agencies score higher for having 15%. What is the impact? What does that do if, if our bond rating went down? And how does that compare to being able to use a greater, um, more uh, money to reduce, for example, a debt exclusion override on the school? Um, so just to show us both sides, like what are the pros and cons of going to 10% instead of 15%? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, I'll ask uh, Sean a second if uh, he wants to respond. Uh, just looking to see, make sure we've nobody else is raising their hands right now in public comment. Sean, do you want to respond to that or not? Uh, sure. So we can make some educated guesses. I think it's it's hard to say exactly what the impact would be or to um, because 
that your bond rating is based off a number of factors, budgetary flexibility being one of them, but it's not the sole factor. Um, so if that score was not to be as strong, um, that would put some downward pressure on our credit rating, but it's, it's not always clear where that breaking point is, where you kind of drop from where your current rating is to the next one below it. Um, so we always try to stay away from anything that's putting downward pressure on our, our bond rating. Um, we know we're gonna start getting some downward pressure on our bond rating just from the debt we're, about, we're going to take on from the, the building project. So that's one area that's unavoidable um, because we've been so low. We've been, you know, we've, we've always had great uh, scores in the debt section, um, but that's, you know, that, that doesn't last forever for any community. So, so we know there's gonna be some areas where we're already getting downward pressure. So we wanna avoid any other areas that might do that because um, going from a, a double A plus to let's say double A, um, again, it's hard to quantify exactly what the impact is on your interest rate, but that's why we have bond ratings. There, there would be some impact on you know, getting a higher interest rate uh, when we would go out for a borrowing. But it, it's based on the market at that time. It's based on how many banks bid on the, the bond. Um, you know, to quantify it is something that, we can ask our financial advisor if he can weigh in on, but I think it'd be hard to do. Um, yeah, but, but I get, but I get the question, which makes sense, which is, you know, the trade-off between that versus um, being able to borrow less on the school project. So yeah, I just want to jump in that you know, even a half a percent or one percent increase in our bond, in our borrowing rate would be significant for these large capital projects because it would last across all of the capital projects, and I think it's not just a, a small one-time thing. Um, and also, I think bond rating agencies look at what you're doing. They look at your strategy, and they look at where you've been and where you're going. So we're we've always shown a pretty coherent approach to how we're financing our capital projects by building up our reserves, expanding our investment and in capital. And they've understood what our strategy has been, and that's worked to our benefit. Um, and so I think that we should be very cautious about um, moving away from that strategy. That's the other thing that I would add to that from my experience, and Bernie was around for this too. Uh, when we uh, confronted the recession that started with the 2007 financial crisis, and it was really 2008, 2009, uh, the need for the healthy stabilization fund that could be used so that we could maintain um, programs during that time was particularly important because it was um, in addition to a loss of funds, there was uncertainty about funds and the uh, stabilization fund provided us with certainty. And uh, it uh, really did matter because what happens when there's a recession is, that the two and a half can continue to go up at two and a half, um, but you, um, but the question of what the state can give in um, state aid to local communities is severely affected during that period of time, and uh, it would it would have caused a great problem for our budget and the need to do a lot of drastic things that. Uh, I was on the finance committee now, but I can speak for the former town manager and finance director. They had absolutely zero desire to go in that direction because they would have had to manage those reductions. And um, the uh, existence of our own rainy day fund was particularly vital. You can never have, tell if it's going to happen again or not. Uh, so that's the other factor that's in there. Uh, so with that said, uh, is there any other general comments? Otherwise, I'm going to take we we'll, might get comments as we go through motions, but um, I would uh, go ahead and start with the motion um, and to look for seconds after I do it. But um, I'm going to start with an easy one. I moved to recommend to the council adoption of approval order FY23-15, an order creating a special purpose stabilization fund for capital projects. Second. Okay, so 
We have a second from Kathy. Is there any further discussion on the order that I just read? Seeing none, then I'm going to um, call for a vote. And uh, because of the uh, fact that we're meeting remotely, I'm going to have to go through. I have an order set up, and I'm going to start uh, just doing it alphabetically and then uh, keep moving down one to start. Uh, so, um, Lynn? Aye. Bob? I support it. Uh, Matt? No, did Matt have to leave us? I think he did. Yeah, it's not here. Make sure that the minutes show that then, please. Um, so one member absent, Bernie. Support. Michelle. Yes, I. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes, and Alicia. Yes. Okay, so. I have it as unanimous um, of voting members five yes and two uh, members supporting who are non-voting members and one member absent. So the second motion is I move to recommend. Hey Andy, Matt's back. Oh Matt, hi. I apologize, Andy. Yeah, I do support the um, the motion. So I am going to amend and change the absent to a support and um, please let the minutes uh, reflect that accurately. Um, I move to recommend to the council adoption of appropriation and transfer order FY 23-14C uh, town of Amherst stabilization fund transfer to capital stabilization fund appropriating from the general stabilization fund to the capital stabilization fund, the sum of $7,815,456. Second. So there's a second um, by Lynn. Is there any discussion on um, the motion that's on the floor. Seeing no dis no hands up in a moment longer, I'll go through as I explained before. So starting with uh, Bob. I support it. Matt. Support. And Bernie. Support. Michelle. I. Uh, Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Michelle. Aye. And Lynn. Aye. So uh, it's five to zero uh, voting members and three uh, non voting members in support. I'm sorry, Andy, you didn't ask me to vote. <laughs> you asked Michelle <laughs> twice. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Alicia, I apologize. And that is. So a yes. So it's a yes. So it's still the same vote as before, but thank you. I apologize. Uh, Bill, give your hand up. I just. It's Mr. Kaysen, are you, are you? Okay, well, I'm going to go on then to the next order. Uh, Bill, if you had your hand up for a reason, just let us know that you are muted so I can't tell. Um, I move to recommend to the council adoption of appropriation and transfer order FY 2312A, an order appropriating from free cash to the stabilization fund $1,678,120. To be transferred, let's see if I get, um, and uh, 140, $134,330 to be transferred to the Reparation Stabilization Fund. Aye. 
Lynn says I. Second. <laughs> I got I got that one first. Let's just, let's just keep going, moving. I. Okay. I. <laughs> any any uh, discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing none. Uh, Matt. Support. Bernie. Support. Michelle. Aye. Uh, Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Michelle. She just did. You get. <laughs> I mean, Chad, how did I do this twice? Alicia. It's okay. Yes. I'm going to get this right one of these days. Um, okay. Lynn. Support. I mean, I. <laughs> and Bob. Support. Okay, so it's unanimous with three non voting members supporting five to zero and three non members non voting. Got to members. ask Bill. Um, can, you, can you hear me now? Because my. Yes. Okay, sorry. What I was going to ask, what I was trying to ask her before my, my uh, microphone wasn't working, is Sean could put up that document that actually had the, um, the orders on it so that it would be easier for me to get them as you go along. Um, I Bill? am going to send you uh, at the conclusion of the meeting um, the page with all of the orders written out on them, so you can just copy them over by okay. cut and paste. Okay. So and, and uh, Bill, they're all in the packet right now too. So you know, as long as you know which order that Andy is calling them out in, <laughs> you can. Yeah, but uh, this way I'll have I have them in in order also. Uh, okay. So um, I will get them to you before the end of the day, but after we had, the meeting adjourns. Uh, okay, thanks. That was part of what we, I was trying to do to make it easier for everybody. Um, next is I move to recommend to the council adoption of appropriation and transfer order 2304B in order appropriating a supplemental increase of 351900 $38 to the town of Amherst operating budget for fiscal year 2023 is set forth for each operating budget category in the table included in the order. Second. So the motion has been seconded by Lynn. And again, I will pause to see if there's any discussion. Uh, seeing no uh, hands up, then uh, this time I think we're starting uh, with Bernie Kubiak. Bernie? Support. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes. Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Aye. Bob. I support it. And Matt. Support. Okay. Uh, I think we have a couple more of these to go. Uh, three, if I got it right. I move to recommend to the council adoption of capital improvement program appropriations, appropriation and transfer order. 2305B, an order appropriating funds for a portion of the Amherst Capital Program ride, road and sidewalk repairs and sum of $1 million for roads and sidewalks. And to meet such appropriation to transfer $1 million from free cash and to further authorize the application for an acceptance of any gifts, requests, or grants. Second. Any discussion on this? This is the $1 million roads, sidewalks that was discussed. So Michelle? Aye. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Aye. Uh, Bob? Support. Uh, Matt? Support. And Bernie? Support. 
So it was five to zero with um, three non-voting members in support. I move to recommend to the council adoption of capital improvement program appropriations, uh, trans appropriation and transfer order 2305B in order appropriating funds for a portion of the- Andy, I think um, I think that one was a duplicate in your- Oh, that's right. Sheet, so you can skip that yeah, one. No, on yeah, one. you're right, you're right. Um, it is, and I don't know why that happened. Um, okay, because it is the track and field that is next. Yep. Move to recommend to the uh, council adoption of appropriation of transfer order FY2305C in order appropriating funds for a portion of the Town of Amherst Capital Program School Track and Field Rehabilitation, appropriating the sum of $900,000 for school track and field rehabilitation and to meet such order, transferring $900,000 from free cash for appropriation and further authorizing the application for and acceptance of any gifts, bequests, or grants. Second. That was Lynn again. Yes. I have a, I have a question, Andy. I'm yes. sorry um, to interrupt. I just I, I, I uh, do see your hand. And okay. I always call for uh, discussion. So go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. What will happen if this project doesn't move forward with th this money that we're appropriating? So if the project doesn't move forward, there's two things that would happen. Um, this money would get closed out and it would go back um, either to free cash or to our uh, sort of our the account where we close out unused capital funds. It would go there and be available for appropriation. So it couldn't be used for anything else until you appropriate it again. Um, so we don't, if, this, if the track and field project doesn't move forward, you don't lose this. Um, the other thing that would happen is the CPA request, which was a debt authorization, that would we bring that back to be rescinded. Um, same thing. And there was a piece of appropriation that we made at the beginning that would then still be used for the track. Uh, are you talking about CPA or um, or the the initial appropriation? The initial did, appropriation. Yeah. So you had an initial. Um, the two things that would still be used for the track would be there was a small CPA appropriation a couple of years ago, which was for design. Um, actually, that probably would not be used. I mean, that was specifically for the larger project. Um, so really, all you would have left would be the 1.5 million debt authorization um, that the region that was approved from the region this May. And that was for that that base project. Kathy? I'm just following, it's a terrific question, Michelle. I thought of it last night and then forgot. Um, but if it didn't move forward and it's earmarked for, I don't know what we call track repair, whether that's capital. When we're in JCPC, we're looking at accounts that weren't spent and Sonia has been able to because they were designated for certain kinds of uses. Would we have that flexibility? Or would we have to put it somewhere and then move it into capital? Um, it's a good question. So, so this would be a little bit unusual, this amount, right. you know, that's usually the project's been completed. There's a little bit left over and you close right. it out and then we can use that to top off um, or we did like a escalation reserve. This is such a large amount. I think we'd have to have a discussion about whether it would go there or would we say, well, this would have gone into the capital stabilization fund had we not had the track and field project because this would have been free cash that would have been above the 5%. Um, so we'd have to have a discussion of what makes more sense at that point, put more into regular capital or should we put it into capital stabilization for the four building projects? So I like that. You know, I wasn't suggesting it go out, of, but I like the fact that it would come back um, mm -hmm. for a discussion. Okay, um, anything else? Because we otherwise um, start voting. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia. Yes. Lynn. Yes. Uh, Bob. Support. Support. Matt. 
you can literally like walk around down support uh bernie support and michelle aye okay so the vote is unanimous five to zero with um three non-voting members in support and um i think that takes care of uh all of the orders if uh I have it correct. So I think that we have completed that portion of the meeting. And um, I'm glad you brought um, Guilford and Chris in. There's one other person I need to have uh, Tiny Kruger brought in also. Because she's uh, representing the petitioners. Okay, so um, the next agenda item is Street Acceptance, Hopbrook Road, Kestrel Lane. This is a major discussion and learning opportunity for um, the group. And uh, I, um, we are not planning to actually take action, but we do need to uh, make sure that we um, understand what the request is and that we um, have identified the information that we feel that we need to make a recommendation to the council. Uh, I saw that Michelle's hand that was up earlier and I don't see it now. I don't know. It's just a really quick point. It can come up later. I just wanted to ask if the orders that we just voted are going to be part of the consent agenda or are we going to at our meeting they have just a point of education they I have to remove the president for that one yeah i mean we have generally not put uh financial orders on consent um because of the two-thirds requirement for some and the majority for others so we'll we'll be going through the same process okay. again all right and we, we need to do the public hearings on those orders as well before the council can vote on Right. So, Connie, I see your hand is up, and I was actually going to start. Mm -hmm. You're muted, however, so yeah. just so you're aware. Got it. Um, uh, and, and could you ask Doug Dinet? Could you ask that Doug Dinet be brought in as well? He's actually the president of the association. He's on the call too, but or on the Zoom also, but he, you didn't bring him in. He's not on the attendee list. I was actually looking is, for him. What's the last name, Connie? Uh, Danelle. So um, is there another name of an account that he could be under? Let me put it this way, Doug. If you're there under a different name, raise your hand. Uh, there we go. There's somebody raised their hand, so I'll bring them in. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Um, I assume you're under Deborah Neubauer. Is that you, Doug? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I forgot to uh, change over names. Thank you. So uh, this is a question for either you or Connie. Um, since you're the petitioners, um, if either of you would like to start with just a really brief um, introduction of what your request is, um, you're welcome to do so. And then the um, next thing I'm going to do is um, ask Chris to give us some, uh, help us with some background questions. So uh, I'll start with the petitioners to see if there's any introductory comments, statements you want to make. Doug or Connie? Oh, I just, um, just to say, Doug is going to um, give an overview of the uh, request for road acceptance that was discussed at town council, then referred to the finance committee and subcommittee. So, um, Doug, I'm, I'm relying on you for the background. That's okay. Yeah. Um, thank you to the members of the council for. Uh, hearing our situation so i i, I don't uh, i know some of the council members heard this when we are at town meeting but um just to give you a little background we're petitioning the town to have our roads uh become public ways 
Um, the Meadows Homeowners Association is 28 houses uh, in South Amherst. Uh, this development was approved uh, through a, a subdivision plan back in the late 90s. Uh, it was completed in 2004, roughly. Um, at that point, there was a punch list generated to complete those final uh, miscellaneous um, tasks associated with the road. Uh, in order for it to be accepted by the town, but that has been the plan all along. So um, I guess I wanna emphasize that this is not like a capricious or spontaneous request to have the town take over the road. This has been a plan that's been in place for a very long time. And for a number of reasons, uh, we've, you know, it's, it's been delayed and pushed off into the future. And now here we are in 2022, almost 20 years later, and we are making a concerted effort to come before the town to have these roads transferred to the town. Uh, they are now uh, owned by Tofino Associates. Um, as part of that process, and as specifically relates to the money piece of it, uh, in 2001, the planning board approved a $130,000 surety bond, uh, that was to be collected in the form of $10,000 per lot as each lot was released uh, when it was completed in the subdivision. Uh, for whatever reason, it was long ago, so no one's sure why, but for whatever reason, only 20,000 of that was collected. Two lots were collected on and the others were released without any funds. So there's, the, there's an escrow account that the town holds right now for approximately $23,000 that would go towards uh, work on the road uh, ostensibly to finish up whatever requirements are required by the town in order to take the road um, over as a public way. Uh, there have been, the homeowners have repeatedly tried through Tofino and now over the last few years to uh, sort of facilitate this process to try to educate ourselves as to how we can um, make this happen. Uh, and so here we are today with, uh, in front of you uh, to, I guess, discuss the financial aspects of this. Um, and I'll turn it over to Connie. Hi, um, yes, thanks for having us at your meeting. Um, I think one of the places we have felt stuck is as we've tried to finalize the items that the town would require to be completed, we have different versions of what we're calling the punch list. Um, one, one list that Tofino has proposed uh, recently with about three items on it to finish up what wasn't done um, with the, as part of the original subdivision. And then um, our Department of Public Works has had um, a number of lists that uh, the town engineer, Jason Skills has prepared. And there hasn't been a coming together with a final written list that we know Tofino is agreeing to and who's agreeing and it is also agreeing to pay for those improvements. So there are some items that need to be fixed and also the roads deteriorated in the last almost 20 years. Um, we know not every single thing is gonna get repaired. That that's okay, but we want to see some movement um, while we're all still alive and can remember what's supposed to happen here because it's gone on for quite a while and sort of a lot of distress for the owners, the 28 households in this neighborhood. So we're looking for resolution of what that punch list is and how to have the three entities, the homeowners, Tofino and the town work together to get this done. It's it's closer, but um, it's sort of like the oasis effect that keeps getting further away as it gets closer. And we just would like to resolve this. So the town council and the finance committee can help with that, that, that would be great. So I'll let um, the other people who are here to speak on this issue, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So I'll say to members of the committee, of course, that at any time during the um, discussion, you have questions, raise your hand and I'll keep my eye out to recognize you. Uh, Chris, um, 
I was wondering if you could start by saying a little bit, if you can, about how the subdivision plan process works and what um, happens at the beginning to assure that the roads um, are um, defined and the specifications are defined as a part of the uh, work of the planning department and the planning board in approving a subdivision. So back in the early 2000s, um, the planning board did review um, two sets of plans, one a preliminary subdivision and um, the second one was the definitive subdivision and the definitive subdivision has actually been um, amended once at least, but um, the planning board has to vote to um, approve the definitive subdivision plan and then that gets filed with the registry and that essentially shows um, the outlines of where the roadway is. In other words, the uh, the property lines that define the roadway. And then there's also a set of construction drawings that goes along with that, that shows all the details of how the road is gonna be built and exactly where the road is falling within the right of way. <coughs> and usually the definitive subdivision plan also has lots, lot lines um, defined, and this one did. Um, I believe that the council has a copy of that definitive subdivision plan that was approved. Um, so then um, the DPW works with uh, the contractor to um, make sure that the roadway gets built properly. The DPW watches over the construction and the roadway gets completed. And then the town engineer prepares a, a punch list of items that are outstanding that need to be completed. And this all happened as Connie and Doug have said back in the early 2000s. And for some reason, I think I know, you know, pretty much what the reason was. Um, there was a downturn in the economy in 2008. Of course, that didn't ha uh, affect what happened in 2004. So you can take that with a grain of salt. And then Doug uh, Cole passed away in 2010. So those are two extenuating circumstances that have caused this thing to last, to you know, pro be prolonged. Um, really what should have happened is that this should have been, um, the roadway should have been completed, the punch list items should have been completed back in the early 2000s, and then the town would have been asked to accept the roadways at that time. And for whatever extenuating circumstances that didn't happen. Um, so now we have a situation where the town only has uh, $23,000, I think, um, as, as surety to complete the roadway. I can't answer questions about how um, the town didn't collect the remainder of that $130,000 because I, I wasn't really here. I was here in 2003, but I wasn't dealing with the planning board at that time. Um, normally what happens is that um, once, um, once the roadway is completed so that half of the properties can be can have access and have can have a, a construction for their um, properties. Then the town starts collecting um, surety for each lot, the second half of the lots. And Connie is familiar with that pro process because she was she's been in the planning department and she knows how that works. But what I I can't. Um, give an, a reason why that money wasn't um, why that money wasn't taken in from Tofino. Um, so in any case, we end up with a situation now where we have a roadway that you know was mostly completed, has deteriorated over time, and now the town has to decide at what point will they take the roadway? Will they take the roadway in its current state and be responsible for fixing whatever needs to be fixed? Will they have a certain list of things that they want to you know, to complete before the roadway is accepted by the town? So that's really a, um, a discussion that has to be made by the by the town council with support from our department and from uh, Guilford Mooring and, and the DPW. And really what is um, I would think would be most helpful would be to get a definitive list of the things that actually have to be completed. We talked about a list of three items when I met with the town council a few weeks ago, but then um, when Guilford met with the planning board prior to that, Guilford said that there were other things, but he didn't have a list of those other things that the town engineer wanted to have completed. So we really need to put these two lists together, the three items with whatever the town engineer thinks still needs to be done, make sure that Tofino does those things, and then 
um, make the decision about um, accepting the roads. So I think that's uh, what I would have to say, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, I, I can come back to you because I can think of a question later. I'm trying to go chronologically through the process of development um, as best I can. So Guilford, if um, I was wondering if there were any records within um, Department of Public Works regarding whether the road construction was monitored to make sure that it was being built consistent with the plans as Chris just um, laid out. So um, we did observe and we, there are records about how the road was built and everything was built according to standards at the time, except when they finished the road construction, there was a punch list. And they basically break down into three areas, storm drainage, <clears throat> sanitary sewer manholes, and then uh, vegetation and side, sidewalk issues are the three, three little areas. The <clears throat> there's a lot, all the catch basins. Um, well, actually some of the catch basins were not the correct place when they were built and they need to be corrected then. Um, others have failed and we feel like they've prematurely failed. There are sanitary sewer, system, sanitary sewer manholes that have some issues and we feel those were kind of, those, those are failed early as well. And then just the fact that before we accept it is the, drain, the sidewalks, there's a couple of places that failed due to work that was done by the builders in the neighborhood. And there's just vegetation that needs to be cut back, which we would require of a new subdivision. Um, the road does have problems, but the road was built, the base was put down and the top coat was put on. Um, the question for the council is, is it acceptable? Is, is the deterioration an acceptable amount of deterioration or is it um, excessive and it should be brought up to um, perfect standards before it's accepted? Um, I kind of, I personally feel that the road was kind of, was put together and is what we see for deterioration, except around the man, except around the catch basins is acceptable deterioration is what you would see. Um, others in my office feel that the road should be brought up to perfect standards before we accept it, because once we accept it, there's um, usually not enough road money to maintain what we have, and we shouldn't be accepting roads that aren't 100%. Um, that's just the, the two camps in our office right here. Um, so that's kind of where we are with this. Um, the catch basin issue is a big issue. Um, there's quite a, quite a bit, quite a few catch basins beyond what I was, I originally thought were a problem. I think almost every catch basin in the neighborhood has an issue and has to be repaired. Um, and that actually would require some uh, work on the road and there was road as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to put this into a broader context, which is that um, Tofino Associates is also having problems with the Amherst Hills uh, subdivision. And what Tofino told me several months ago was that they wanted to wrap up the Amherst Hills issues and then they would turn to the, the Meadows issues. And so um, that was their plan as of you know six months or a year ago. And um, now we're kind of like reversing that. Um, and so this, this was not something that I expected. So I guess the reason I'm saying this is because I think Tofino has done a good job in completing the work that needed to be done on the Amherst Hills project. And that is, as far as I know, pretty much like 85 to 90% wrapped up. And I got a list last week from the town engineer listing some things that needed to be addressed. I think they were either three or five catch basins that were problems, one detention basin that had trees growing out of it that needed to be fixed, and then one other thing. So I guess the reason I'm telling you this is because um, Tofino has shown that they can do this work and can complete it based on the Amherst Hills project. So whether you want them to 
do the same thing with um, the meadows, that would be a conversation that we'd have to have with Tofino. Are they ready to do that or are they not going to do that? Um, and so one, so anyway, I just wanted to put that into context. Tofino is also trying to get the Emerson Hills roadways accepted. And I think they have um, sent you a request for that. And you are going to have that on your um, an agenda upcoming. The plan, the town council will have that on an agenda, either October nineteenth or November. No, not October nineteenth. Either some meeting in October or some meeting in November. Um, that that will be upcoming. So um, I guess in my mind, do you want to push Tofino on both things at the same time, or do you want to let them get? Amherst Hills wrapped up and then move on to the meadows and are they going to be more likely to come forward and actually do something on the meadows if they don't have Amherst Hills on their minds so I'm just putting all this information out there and you're the ones who um, need to discuss this and make the decisions. Lynn? Uh, I, I believe uh, why don't you take Connie and Doug next and then i I'm just trying to get to the point that I think councils have councillors and our other members have questions. Yeah, um, I've been watching uh, to see if uh, Hans got from the committee, but uh, one of the uh, the question that was just wanted to confirm: we have received a request, Lynn, or have we not regarding Amherst Woods uh, or Amherst Hills, rather? We have received one. It, we were actually thinking it was going to go on the meeting yet last night. Right now, we either go on November 7th, I, I'm sorry, October 17th or November 7th, uh, whenever Chris indicates to the town manager that it's ready. Okay. Um, Kenny and Doug, I'll be back to you in a second, but I wanted to um, hear from Kathy. Lynn, did you have a question before or or just you were? I have, I, I need to say a couple things, but you know, um, first of all, I have fired, filed a non-disclosure statement. I am familiar with the head of Tofino because he was president of the Survival Center. He was also vice president of the Survival Center when I was president of the Survival Center board. I do not see this as a conflict, but I just want to be upfront and say that I do know the uh, Ted Parker and have worked with him closely in a totally separate capacity. And I just, for the sake of discussion, I know Bob Hagner has a similar statement he needs to make. Yeah, I, I also just want to um, say that I, I, Doug Cole built my house. I, I knew Doug very well. Um, but I don't have any um, involvement with um, the uh, the um, Meadows uh, development at all, uh, other than walking there um, in the mornings. Um, but um, I, I don't think I have any um, any uh, conflict that would prevent me from reaching uh, objective decisions. Okay. Um, so. Councilors, uh, who have your hands up still? Is okay if we go back to uh, the petitioners for a moment and sure. uh, let them respond? And kind of you your hand up first. That's um, okay. Um, I'm a little uh, distressed that it's suggested that we wait until after Amherst Hills is resolved. I, I, I Mr. Parker could have attended the town council meeting, he could have attended this meeting. We actually we're working with him in our timing to submit our request. So Amherst Hills is a very, uh, they're on their own timeline. They have litigation to resolve and maybe uh, they've done a good job finishing that up, but it's still not done. And we have had a very difficult time having Tofino be responsive, responsive to us. The planning board somewhat recently in the spring released lots at Amherst Hills which is an asset of the corporation that we're trying to deal with that are uh, 
some legal disagreement, and I think uh, Ms. Prescript and I may disagree about this, that um, the assets of the corporation are, are potentially up, up for grabs for um, our neighborhood as part of this. There are no separate uh, limited liability corporations formed. It's been very frustrating uh, to deal with Tofino, and we they committed to finishing our project agreeing to a punch list. And I don't understand why that should come after Amherst Hills. There isn't a legal reason in my mind to do that. And Mr. Parker could be here representing himself right now. It's hard to channel what he would say, um, but we submitted that road request with his approval and his blessing. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say on that one. Okay. You muted. You're still muted, so we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, I I just want to add that we have made a an intentional choice to not um, to try to not be con confrontational, to try to be cooperative with all various parties. Uh, we finally came before the planning board because we were just out of sheer frustration at not being able to get this process to move. Uh, various past presidents have been working on this. I didn't go through the entire history, but this has been an active issue that we've been working on for at least 10 years. Um, we have had several meetings with all the various parties, many meetings actually over the last couple of years. And the fact that we still don't even really have a resolved punch list that we can, that Tofino can wrap their mind around in terms of how much this is gonna cost and begin to schedule contractors so that it becomes um, real. In other words, it, it's been a very abstract conversation up until now. Uh, so I guess, I don't know how the process works where, you know, I myself am just a homeowner. I'm not, I'm just trying to represent the various households on the street um, but we've really lost confidence in Tofino and we're trying to find a path forward to get them to finish the road. And, you know, so that's really all I have to add. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to now uh, recognize some of the counselors who've had hands up and I'll, Lynn, you've been the one who's had your hand up the longest. So I personally would like to understand why is, is, is Tofino not able to take both projects on at the same time because it, of the cost, because of supplies, because of um, whatever? The, that's one question. Uh, the second question is, um, I would prefer that the town council not be the group that has to resolve the punch list, but I'm going to be extremely clear about my bias, and that is we cannot accept any more bad roads in Amherst. We have too many already. And so... I, I want to help these people. This has been a frustrating process. I This is my district. And I want to make sure that, however, in the process of trying to help move this forward, we also protect the town's assets. And if you want to see some bad roads, I'll take you on a tour anytime you want to come. Come visit my house. Kathy? So uh, I'll build on what Lynn just said. Um, I, I don't understand. I mean, I heard and I tried to write down exactly what Guilford said, but it, it seemed to, he seemed to be saying there's not consensus uh, at DPW. I think we need consensus from DPW and a list of what needs to be done. And then I agree with Lynn. I don't think we should accept these unless it gets done. And I don't understand 
what leverage we have um, to force that to happen. Um, but I don't think we should. A, I have no ability to look at this, the items of three, and then Guilford said um, there are more of the drain sewers that have trees in them or vegetation, but I think it needs to be a very concrete list that Tofino is presented with that our DPW and or planning department says this is the list, and if the roads have deteriorated with no um, maintenance on them, I don't think we should take them that way. Um, I understand it's been a really long time and how frustrating it is, but I, I think to the extent that council can speak strongly and that provides leverage to get something to happen, both for our staff to create the list. I don't think it's good enough to say there might be other things. I think we need a list. Um, and this is the list with some, a list by X date um, that, and it shouldn't be 2026. Um, it should be, <laughs> it should, Connie's laughing at me, but I mean, it should be, um, soon um, on a this is the list. And if all of this gets done, then there would be recommend. And I also think we should have a recommendation coming up from staff, not just from petitioners, then we're ready to accept. Um, so so that's, that's where I'm, I have reread this memo a few times, and you presented it to us initially. Um, and I'm just very grateful that the road that's outside my window is a state road and they did a really good job of repairing it <laughs> really good um, but for a while it was miserable but when they did it um it it was repaired so that would be my position but I just wanted to echo what Lynn said but on the list I think we as counselors should be saying town staff um and it sounds like it's DPW reach agreement um, don't have, we have a difference of opinions, reach agreement and come up with a document um, by a certain date, you know, whatever that date should be. I don't know whether we could have it in two weeks, in a month. I don't know what the right is. I don't want to put pressure, but um, it sounds like there are more significant problems than even if the list of three, because in each of those three, there are more elements of it. So rather than one sewer, or one drainage pit, there are trees and trees growing in them. So I, yeah, and I'd be happy to walk these streets, but I am not a road engineer and can't generate the list. Thank you. I'm gonna stick with uh, members of the committee for a couple of, and then I'm gonna to go to town staff um, so we can make sure we get all of the uh, committee questions out, Bernie. Uh, I, I have to admit, I was puzzled when I saw this on the agenda as to why the Finance Committee is involved with um, the uh, approval of a, a subdivision road. It seemed unusual to me. It still does seem unusual to me. I, I think what has to happen here, because the town owns some of this, uh, when the town is not going to escape some of the some of the responsibility for either failure to monitor or frittering away the escrow account, uh, which is our leverage in this. So the town owns some of it. So I think if you wanna to get to the position of saying there's over 20 years, this is normal deterioration and we're gonna we're gonna end up accepting it, then I think we should do that. But I do agree with what Kathy was saying that we need a definitive list. Here's what you need to fix to Fino Associates, period. Uh, and we need the town council's memo was not enlightening at all as to how we go about enforcing this or pro uh, uh, provoking Tofino to, to, to finish his work. Uh, that has to, you know, that has to happen because we, we need to know what leverage, what leverage the town has in the situation. And I think this is really, this really comes down to, um, you know, managing this situation so that counselors feel uh, appropriate in, in, in adopt and accepting the roads um, I don't see why uh, Tofino has to be given any more time on this. It's uh, the company can walk and chew gum, uh, I would assume. So that's that's my my point on this. I feel badly for folks because uh, this is is clearly something that they uh, uh, they have had no control over. 
it's difficult when you're <laughs> when you're living on a private way and which you 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 bought your house expecting that it was going to become a public way uh and you're on a private way and that private way disintegrates and you've got 28 people or 28 houses that you may have to get together to come up with a maintenance plan i think that's that's really unfortunate the bottom line here is Tofino needs to get um, a definitive list of, of what has to happen. The town's attorney needs to be able to tell us clearly what leverage we have in the situation and how we can force, if Tofino won't come up with a reasonable time timetable, how we can force Tofino into action and then uh, get this back to uh, get this back completed and get it back to council so council can vote on it. Um, not the finance committee. Thanks. Um, the, the one thing that I can say is just that uh, it's in the finance committee because the council voted to send it to the finance committee. And uh, whether uh, anybody can share why that motion was made as opposed to some other motion, I'm not the one to answer it. I just know that it was made and passed. And so it's here. Um, and uh, Michelle. Yeah, my my son's about to get in the car. So I thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to share that I feel very, very sympathetic to the petitioners here and um, particularly hearing that there's another neighborhood with the same developer that's coming forward with a similar request and I could just feel the frustration in my own body. So um, I am wondering, um, so I understand what the process is. If we accept the roads, does that automatically force the developer to take care of the punch list? Or And, and, and so I agree with what Bob said about getting some sort of legal opinion on that and what uh, authority or agency we will have if we do accept the roads, um, we may, you know, never be able to get them to do the punch list. So also understanding what the cost would be, um, I think would be really important and having a lot of clarity as others have said about that. So uh, that's where I'm at right now. But again, feeling very sympathetic and, and hoping that we can find a solution for this to happen. Yeah, um, thank you. I think that the, uh, and we'll get, um, staff is gonna uh, now be able to provide some supplemental information, but it's common that uh, the punch list is taken care of before, but it's also common that it happened on a lot faster timetable than this has happened. And uh, so we have two, you know, two factors that are out there for consideration. Uh, once we accept the road, though, uh, I think that it becomes a done deal so that if we expect things to be done before we accept the road, uh, we have to do that because once if we do accept the road and own it, then it's ours. Uh, Guilford, you've had, your hand's been up for a while and there's been a lot of questions that have been asked about the punch list. So yes, I, I would first like to make one clarification. We have done a punch list every time it's been requested of us. We've made about 20 punch lists. The punch list when we first were asked to make one back in the early 2000s was relatively small and did not include repairing the road surface. As time drug on and we got asked, we'll make another punch list. We made another punch list, make another punch list. We've made another punch list. We have made multiple punch lists. The issue is, is that the process for acceptance was never started. So there was no real deadline given to the developer. The process for accepting the road was laid out, has been, has been provided a couple of times. I don't know if we have a copy of it or not, but once the developer or the group of people who now own this private road ask for acceptance, the council, as since we're now a, really a city, they have to say yes or no, they want to look at possibly doing this. Once they do that, then an actual definitive timeline starts. The planning board has so many days to make a response. 
we have as a public works have to make a formal this is the list um, and that's a formal thing and to tell the truth the public works department is probably as frustrated as the neighborhood is is that we're always being asked to make a list and not much gets done so we would much prefer to either start the process and have a definitive timeline that says this is what's going to happen and if you don't do it in that timeline or this is the timeline, and in this timeline, the council is going to vote, and it's up or down. Um, that's really what one of my real reasons for wanting to move about this, because we've made list. I actually have a person who may quit if I tell him to make another list, because um, he's made so many lists. Um, we just need to get this to some point where we're at a point where we're telling the developer, if you want this to be a private, a public road, you need to do this and finish it. Or it's going to stay a private road and we're going to stop plowing the road and we're going to stop doing some of the things we already do on the road. Sorry. No, that's, um, I appreciate that. Um, and I went and then Chris said her hand up too. And I saw they were in a town staff mode. One of the um, things that um, your memo to the council laid out the three steps. The first step is to define the layout and then the, the second step is acceptance. Um, do we know that the um, layout is satisfactorily described by the plan that um, was provided to the council and that you referred to earlier? Chris? Is that a, oh, that's a question for me. Yes. I uh, I do not know, but I think the town engineer would know. Do you know, uh, Guilford, do you know? The, the layout, the road is in the proper layout. It's not outside what they're proposing to give to us. The road is in that layout. Is in the layout as was defined to the planning board and that we have. Yes. Okay. Chris, did you have anything else that I have a list of things. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I think this process was um, premature, and I know that the residents are very eager to get the roadway accepted. But the way this was done forces the planning board to hold a meeting within 45 days. This process was referred to the planning board for a, a recommendation. So now the planning board is going to be put in the same position that you all are being put in right now. And I'm scheduling that meeting for October 19th. And I am not comfortable making a recommendation to the planning board on accept the road or don't accept the road because I don't have a clear um, recommendation from DPW or anyone in the town structure about whether the planning board should say this road should be accepted or not. And the planning board is going to look to me for a recommendation. So I think at least town staff needs to get together and decide what is our recommendation. Are we going to recommend that, that the road be accepted um, flaws and all with some of these things fixed? Or are we going to say, no, we're not going to accept the road until this larger punch list is fixed? And so what I'm fearing right now is that the, I'm going to go to the planning board on October 19th, and they're going to say we recommend that we that the town doesn't accept the road. And then what do we do? Then do we start the process all over again? I know that the planning board's recommendation is not binding, but it still will have some um, impact on the town council, I'm sure. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, and... Another thing I wanted to say, just put this out there, when Tofino was pushed in the Amherst Hills situation, they actually turned around and sued all the residents in the neighborhood, um, more or less telling them that they owned part of this um, work that was to be done. So they're still in that lawsuit with the residents and the residents are, you know, some of them are deciding to pay up and some aren't deciding to pay up and it's a mixed bag and I don't really know much about this lawsuit, but I do know that, um, you know, Tofino did that when they were pushed and so I'm just making that statement because I feel like that's something that should be out in the open. Um, 
so I'm not ready to make a recommendation to the planning board about what the, whether the roadway should be accepted or not, because I, I feel like, you know, Guilford and the town manager and I need to come with, up with a joint recommendation on this. Um, the other thing is I had a conversation with Tofino a couple of weeks ago, and they told me that the work hasn't been done to complete the Amherst Hill subdivision because they can't get people to work on it because all the contractors are busy. So I'm assuming that they will say the same thing about the Meadows subdivision. So um, this to me is a like a mayor's nest. And I, I'm sorry to say that. I usually try to come to town council with a clear idea of what should be done. But in this case, I really don't have a clear idea of what should be done. Thank you. Uh, Doug. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, echo or and validate what both um, Guilford and Chris is saying. That has been our experience. It, the, specifically to the punch list, um, as a part of doing our due diligence, given that we were aware of the history that was going on at Amherst Hills, the litigation that was going on, I took uh, J Jason's punch list. He was good enough to walk the road with me and we walked it together with Warner Brothers and I got an estimate. I know how much money, I mean, this was $2020. So it's, it's different now. I understand that, but I know how much this is going to cost. And it's frankly, it's not that much money to bring this road up to speed. The problem has been one of obfus obfuscation, one of resistance, one of just procrastination and an unwillingness to communicate. And we ended up coming before the town because we ran out of options. We ran out of ability to move anything forward. So we just realized the, our only leverage because now we no longer even had the lots as leverage was public opinion. Uh, and I just wanna say it is a mess, but the person who should be here explaining why this situation is as it is, is not here. And I think that speaks volumes. And I, you know, I don't know him. I don't have a personal uh, score on any of this. I'm just reflecting what our experience has been as homeowners appealing to the developer, you know, to, to finish what should be completed. I also hope that the town will take a look at their subdivision plans and at some point perhaps consider putting a statute of limitations on when a developer is permitted, you know, how much time he has or she or they have to complete a project. At this point, as far as I understand, it's completely open-ended and here we are 20 some odd years later and we have a mess. So thank you. Yeah, unfortunately we can't go back and redo it again. We are where we are, Lynn. So one of the issues that I think we're dealing here with here is the, this is the first time the town's been asked to accept a road. There's been a, other people who've said, could you accept our road? And, you know, when they look at the standards, they realize that they're not even close. Um, so if we need to redo something at the town council uh, in terms of how we do this, I'm more than glad to do this. If this needs to be referred to TSO because they deal with public ways, we can do that. Uh, but the bottom line for me is that we have residents who have come to us because unless they want to put a lot of money out to sue, they run out of options. And I think the minimum we can do is give them a punch list. I've already stated my serious qualifications for that punch list. And that is the road has to be brought up to the standard of a new road. We just can't take on any more debt for roads. I have other parts of my district that are telling me they won't vote for certain things or certain people if they don't get their roads fixed. So. It, this is not, we need more guidance. Chris, I understand where you're coming from, but these residents need that a finalized punch list and move forward. And if we need to redo or think about how the council votes or doesn't vote at this point, I'm more than glad to have that come back to the council for reconsideration. 
Paul has his hand up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul? Yeah, so much of this is regulated by state law. So there isn't a lot that the town can do in terms of the process that, that we need to follow to accept a public way. So that, I think I, I agree with what Doug and Connie says, they were frustrated. They, this is the way to trigger it. And I understand it, it didn't fit the timeline that, that Chris thought, but it, it's what the, they initiated the petition and, it, and it's moving forward. And that does create time constraints. And that's purposeful, I think, is to create some decisions. Um, I think, you know, Chris and um, Guilford and I can certainly get together and give the definitive punch list. Um, you know, I think that will be a large number. Um, then the, and I think Bernie said, why is this before the finance committee, which is a very legitimate question. I think the reason is, is that there, if depending on what the council wants to do with accepting a road and, and it's different, depending on the condition of the road, it may be taking on a, a liability. So if the road isn't pristine, the council is going to make a decision. I'm going to accept the road as is. A council could just say, we accept it just as it is. There's no more investment that needs to be made. And then, but the council needs to be aware that there's a liability that the town is accepting at that moment in time. Or the council can say, we only will accept a road that's in pristine condition. And that's going to have a dollar figure that is attached to it. Um, so it's just trying to figure out where the standard is that the council is expecting that to be. And it's, we have recommendations from our professional engineers as to where we think it should be, but ultimately it's the council's decision. So what you just said sort of gets to the next question that I had, which is that uh, we really have no control over when the Meadows did or um, Amherst Hills um, it makes a request to have street acceptance. Those are their decisions. And if that means that Fino and Susius has to walk and chew gum at the same time, to use a phrase that was used before, that's not anything that we can do anything about. I, I think the challenge here though, Andy, is that Tofino doesn't have a vest doesn't necessarily have a vested interest in this, I think. Um, yeah, other than to it's the property owners who are the ones who are going to suffer for, if it's failed, if it doesn't get accepted by the town. Um, well, let me take on Bernie. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I am, like I said, I still am puzzled why this is in front of the finance committee, um, because clearly it's, it's, a, an issue that needs to be managed. And I, I think that, uh, Christine and, uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Guilford, we have some real competent capable folks. I think Christine's suggestion that the three of you sit down, come up with uh, some kind of definitive statement that can be presented to Tofino that says, this is what you need to do. And that can be explained to the council. that This is what you need to do would be real, very, really very helpful. I also think that the town attorney needs to be involved to see where we have, they have some leverage because Paul is correct. Tofino has, uh, Tofino really doesn't have any skin in the game. He can walk away from this. Um, or the company go walk away from this. Uh, we want to figure out how we can we can get them back into uh, into to, to the process and and catch their attention. <clears throat> uh, and again, uh, as much as I hate to disagree with Lynn, I don't think that having a pristine sub road is going to be the the outcome. Uh, I think there's going to have to be some compromise in here again to rec to recognize the fact that the leverage the escrow accounts. I'm gone. Uh, Twenty-three thousand dollars of this still. Uh, so there's nothing really here to seize, except that twenty twenty-three thousand. But the 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 to get our uh, uh, our team together to get Chris Paul and and Guilford together and Guilford, I uh, <clears throat> I can appreciate your level of of, of frustration, uh, you know. But you you have um, you have pretty good judgment, and I I think you can take the umpteen lists you have and whittle them down into one definitive statement and then we can begin to move from there but um you know that's you can sense my frustration with this i'm i'm, I'm sorry i'm sort of stammering through this i'm still um jet lagged <laughs> but uh, um 
there there is a re there will be a resolution to this, but uh, if it's done in the wrong way, it's going to be the homeowners who end up with a, a pretty sorry state. Thanks. So we are after five and we were going to try and adjourn today at five for a variety of reasons that I previously stated. Uh, say uh, for some people it, who are observant, it's a holiday coming up at uh, sunset. And uh, the other is that uh, I know that uh, we already lost one member of the committee because uh, she had to pick up her son. Uh, so those, uh, that's why we started at three instead of 3.30. Uh, I don't know the, what else we can do though. I, uh, Paul, uh, do you think that uh, we can move forward with uh, making sure that we have a definitive punch list? And if so, um, do we need to couple that with the commitment then to um, create a conversation that with Tofino uh, so that that punch list can get presented, agreed to, and moved forward. Is that really a, a, a council function or is that an executive function? So we can certainly work on getting the punch list and sharing that with the property owners and with uh, Tofino. And that, I think that's the first step. Andy, and then I think we can work with you in terms of the next time it would show up on the finance committee's agenda. Okay, so I'm going to turn just to the finance committee with the observation that it was referred to us. So it's uh, whether we like it or not, it's in our bailiwick. I think that we have spent a lot of time today just trying to understand the issue. I think that um, I appreciate the cooperation of everybody who's been here to help us along with that process of learning. Um, but uh, is there agreement that um, having, uh, Paul take over to work with uh, staff and uh, to get the punch list um, defined and to work with, to bring Tofino into the process makes sense. Lynn. I'd like to a uh, state a date certain by when the we will get information back and i don't know what's reasonable but i don't want to be sitting here you know a year from now hearing about how we need yet another punch list because we did this one but nothing happened so now that this has come out in the public i'd like to make sure that we at least are kept abreast of what's being done and frankly, to keep it in the public eye. So, uh, I don't know what a reasonable date my, is. I just, yeah. you know. Well, we'll, we'll have something back be, before your, by, by your next meeting for sure. Okay. I mean, even if it's just a report, mm -hmm. at least it keeps it moving. So if uh, we could get a report by the next meeting, I think that would be very helpful all and um, is there anybody else from the committee who would like to raise the point because I have one last thing to do to, um, so that we can complete the committee's uh, work and adjourn for the day um, if there's something else then on the agenda item for street acceptance at this time thank you to uh, petitioners Guilford and uh, Chris for having um, helped the committee out a lot. Um, Connie and Doug and uh, Guilford and Chris, it's been very helpful um, to allow the committee to really understand the issue and begin to move forward a little bit. So thank you very much. Um, the, the thing that I have left over is that we have a bunch of unapproved minutes. I want to thank uh, Bob and uh, Kathy for helping me in reviewing minutes. Uh, they fall into um, categories. There's a whole group of them, but in, um, most of them have been reviewed by at least one member of the committee. They've all been in our, in our packets for some period of time. Uh, 
and uh, some of them are just, uh, I, you know, it was the judgment of the reviewer that they're ready to move forward. The rest of them have very small corrections. Um, I think that the biggest correction is actually just in one, and that's it, to add a sentence. And there was a May meeting in which I left to go to a um, MMA committee meeting and then came back and my departure was uh, included in the minutes, but my return was not included in the minutes. So it's, so the, it's adding a sentence that said that uh, uh, I, I'd returned to the meeting and uh, that Kathy continued to chair I mean, it's, it's essentially it. So these are very minor. So with that ex explanation, I'm gonna make a motion, which is I move to approve minutes of the following meetings as amended April 12, 2022, April 26, 2022, May 3rd, 2022, May 12, 2022, May 17, 2022, and September 6, 2022, and approve the following minutes as submitted May 3, 2022, May 10, 2022, June 21st, 2022, and July 19, 2022. Second. Okay, there's been a motion that has been made and seconded. Um, is there any discussion or comment on the motion? Otherwise, I'm going to call for a vote. Um, Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Aye. Uh, Bob? Support. Uh, Matt? Support. Um, Bernie? Support. Michelle has uh, had to leave the meeting, so she's absent. Kathy? Yes. And I mean, yes. So it's four to zero with one absent of voting members and support of all three members. Is there any other business that um, I have none to suggest anything that was un unanticipated 48 hours in advance? Um, to be offered by any members of the committee. I have none in this, seeing nothing, then I think we are adjourned and understand that um, two weeks from today, uh, we will meet at either three or 3.30 and we will get in the exact time to you as quickly as possible. And that a major purpose of the meeting will be um, a further presentation by Sean um, going more deeply into the uh, capital plan for the major buildings and that um, other councilors will be invited. It will be, and it will be posted as the uh, council meeting, should there be uh, enough members that it requires, that it reaches a quorum of the council. So with that said, uh, I think I can just declare the meeting adjourned and thank you very much. Thanks to the people that did the minutes. You're welcome. Thank you guys. <laughs>